I'm Pastor Bob Thibodeau, and we are going to have this special presentation this week to discuss the Christian response to the coronavirus and all that is happening right now. As I take it from the Bible, as I'm led by the Holy Spirit to share with you. Hello, everybody out there on Facebook land. We're so glad that you are joining us this day. Praise God for you. We want to encourage you with the Word of God. We want to, to sow the Word into your life. The peace of God that passes all understanding should comfort our hearts and minds right now in this situation. Glory to God. There is nothing to fear. As Winston Churchill used to say, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. Fear is not of God. Fear is of the devil. And God trumps the devil every single time. Now, this coronavirus was not created by God and unleashed on this earth. This virus is of the devil. God is the author of life. God, there's no fear in God. There's love. Fear, death, sickness, disease, all of that comes from one source. That is the devil. Now, Brother Bob, then why doesn't God stop it? The devil's the one you need to ask the questions about, not God. God could stop this in one breath. But what the devil meant for harm, God turns to good. Look at Job. Job was righteous. Job was doing everything right. Job was prosperous. Job had everything. And the devil said, you take it all away, watch him curse you to your face. And God said, just don't touch him. You touch everything he has, just don't touch him. Job suffered more. And they, they, some scholars say that all of this happened, every, the entire book of Job happened in about six months' time. He lost his family. He lost his crops. He lost his servants. He lost his uh, livestock. He lost everything. And then he still refused to curse God. His own wife was inspired by the devil. Say, just, you know, you keep holding on to this God stuff. Just curse God and die. He said, You speak like a fool. He says, I had nothing when I came to this world. If I have nothing when I go out, so be it. But I will not curse my God. <laughs> then the devil sent friends to him to minister to him. Instead, they started condemning him. You did something wrong. Go ahead and confess it. Come on. You, you must have done something to deserve all this. Finally, Job did question God. And God responded by questioning him. Where were you when I created everything? Did you have any input into this? In other words, God's saying, I'm the one that's in control. The devil meant this for harm. I'm turning it to good. And Job realized his mistake and repented. That's when God healed him. Now, what I'm saying, I, I just summarized the entire book of Job for you because that's not in my notes to go there. The devil meant it for harm. God allowed it to happen to Job, knowing Job's true self would prove God's point. That the true Christian will not question God. The true Christian, the true believer will not doubt God. The point I'm trying to make is this. Do not question what God is doing right now. Do not doubt what God is doing right now. We know from the past several years of preaching and observing what's happening in the news all around the world, the Christian persecution, the rampant rise of homosexuality and gay marriage and transgenderism and the abortion rights and stopping prayer in schools and all, you know, the Christian persecution all across the world now coming to the United States of America, 
All of this points to one event. And that's the wrap up of human history. We know from what the Bible says, from what the prophets have said, that the end is right around the corner. We are living in the last minutes of the last hours of the last days of human history. It will not be long before Jesus returns. It will not be long before those who are believers and those who have already died that were believers will be resurrected from the dead and will all be caught up together with him while the world undergoes such horrendous times. You think this virus is bad? You think being shut up right now inside your homes and social distancing is bad? You think, you know, having to wear a mask, go out in public and gloves and, and social distancing is bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. There have already been attempts at permanently shutting down churches. There has already been attempts at isolating Christians, just just preach online, they're being told. You don't have to open up them church buildings. This is a precursor. This, when the seven years of tribulation hit, this is going to be like a scrimmage game. This is going to mean nothing. Economies of the world are crashing right now, but they will rebound when things reopen. Seven years of tribulation, they will not rebound. The Bible is very clear on that in the book of Revelation. I'm saying all this to let you know that God is using this virus right now, this situation, this COVID-19, coronavirus, China virus, whatever you want to call it. God is using this. There, I seen a report last week that for... Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, more people were online listening to preaching than at any other time in the history of the internet. Think about that. More people worldwide heard the gospel preached on one day than at any other time in human history. You don't think that's of God? devil didn't want that. He'd rather have you watch cat videos or something like that online, not listen to the word of God. More people were born again last Sunday than at any other point in human history. This is of God. The devil meant it to bring division and destruction and death. God used it to enlarge the body of Christ. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is larger right now because of this virus. That's not saying again that God put it on this world. No. No, he did not. The devil is the one that unleashed it. Using humans, whether it came from China, bats or labs, that is something that is beyond our capability to even work with on your level and my level. What is important is to realize God got people born again in this. God moved in this. God is turning what the devil meant for harm to good. And that's something we need to rejoice in. Is it hard to stay social distancing? Is it hard to stay at home? Is it hard financially? Yes, no doubt about it. Businesses are going to be closed forever. The people will be going bankrupt. That's terrible. People will be unemployed because of it. That's terrible. Absolutely terrible. But it goes to show all of us how important it is to maintain control of our finances. This world lives on a debt income. The businesses that are going under are ones that struggle financially anyway. The ones that are going under have that 
you know, we borrowed money to open, we borrow money to, to operate. And, you know, we, the income coming in, we, after we pay everybody and buy our essentials, we've got a little bit to left over and we're just, you know, paying the bills as we go. Those companies that are debt free are like, okay, we're just holding up right now. Yes, they're losing money, but they don't have to worry about paying bills. Now, I'm not saying that in a condemning way. I'm not trying to condemn anyone or any business. I'm talking about the overall economic situation of the United States. The government owes $23 trillion. Owes $23 trillion. You know, this four, five, eight, whatever trillion dollar program that's going to be added to this. I seen a report just a couple days ago. By the time this pandemic situation, all these economic stimulus packages are given, our debt will exceed our GDP. In other words, your debt payments, the amount of money you will be owing is now going to be greater than the amount of money you got coming in. If you are running your household in that fashion, where you're making $5,000 a month, but you owe $6,000 a month in payments. What are you going to do? Now, if you're at your own household level, you may have to go out and get a part-time job and, and struggle along. The problem is, as you pay down the debt, you spend it again to go back up. You know, if I have $5,000 a month coming in and my bills are $6,000, I am now robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, I'll miss this payment over here in order to make these, and then I'll miss this one over here to catch this one up. And it doesn't take that long before the whole thing comes collapsing down on itself and you're forced to declare bankruptcy. All of these bills, all of these debts are backed by what? The full faith and credit of the United States of America, the government. And if the government declares bankruptcy, then the entire economic system collapses. Think about that. That's where we are headed. The Bible says so. The Bible is very clear on that. That in the end times, the whole you know, house of cards collapses on itself. I can say one thing about that. Praise God. Praise God for his word. Praise God that he gives us this information so Christians can make the right choices while there is still time. He gives us this information so we can share the good news of salvation with each and every single person. My prayer is that those who are in the hospital and those that are dying of this virus, that they will receive the good news of salvation and prepare to meet the Lord. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed our next breath. There will be some people somewhere in the world dying before the end of this broadcast. I think I, I've seen a statistic a few weeks back that I think it's, a, I think it's 150,000 people a day. I may be all wrong on that, but right in that area are dying every day. Not of the virus, just you know, on a normal, normal day. 150,000 people worldwide die, die every day. The point being, we are not in control of when that is. Now, you can be somewhat in control. You know, if you're not living a healthy lifestyle and, you know, you're doing things, you know, injecting drugs and doing all these things that contribute to destroying your cells, you're going to die faster, of course. You know, someone who shoots heroin and smokes three packs of cigarettes a day and drinks a fifth of whiskey a day will not live as long as someone who's, a, you know, eating healthy and taking care of their body. That's just obvious. But 
even the healthiest person, the person who runs, you know, 20 miles a day and doesn't eat anything fattening and, you know, just, I mean, living healthy as can be, that person will die one day. He has that, he or she has no control over what day that will be. You can die sitting in your rocking chair under home isolation, watching, you know, the news on TV of a heart attack. Or you could be going to the grocery store and getting a car accident. Or you could be walking through the grocery store and a satellite fall out of space and crash into the grocery store and kill, you know, 150 people in one swoop. Or an uh, airplane could lose control and come crashing into your house. Or you could catch the virus and die two weeks later. You have absolutely no control over those situations. The point I'm trying to make is everybody has to die at some point in time. The only thing you have control of is whether or not you go to heaven or hell. That's it. That is the only thing you have control over is the decision to believe that Jesus bought and paid for the forgiveness of all your sins or not. If you don't believe it, that is your decision. Well, I don't know. I got to think about it. That is your decision. And if you die 15 seconds from now, that was your decision not to make a decision. Not to make a decision is a decision only you can make. Now, I said all that is the introduction to what I want to talk about. Glory to God. This story that I'm going to share with you is from Matthew chapter 14, and it begins uh, in verse 22. And it's a story where Jesus sends his disciples to the other side of the lake while he sends the crowds away, and then he comes walking to them on the water. And then uh, we'll ju just jump down here to... Uh, verse 24. Matthew 14, verse 24. The ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. So Jesus sends them away. Then he disperses the crowds, and he's praying. Then he starts walking out to them. He's going to catch up with them. The wind's contrary. It means it's blown against the direction that they're trying to travel. Now, from what I understand, the Sea of Galilee is, you know, like eight, ten miles wide at that point, and they're not even halfway there. The wind is blowing against them, the waves are high. You know, they knew they shouldn't have been out on the lake, but Jesus made them go out there anyway. And then in verse 26, the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water. And they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. They cried out for fear. And straight away, Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. There it is again. Throughout the Bible, every time fear comes, we're told, do not fear. Fear not. Do not be afraid. We're not supposed to fear this virus. We're not supposed to fear it at all. Fear is of the devil. Faith is of God. He's trying to tell him, have faith. It's me. Peter, in verse 28, answered him, said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out to you on the water. Now, he kind of put Jesus in a pickle right there. Jesus could have said, Oh, Peter, hold on there, boy. You know you can't walk on the water. Only I can walk on the water. You can't walk on the water. Or the other thing he could have said was, no, it's not me. Well, you couldn't say that. That would have been a lie. Peter said, if it's really you, Jesus, then tell me to come to you on the water. So what did Jesus say? Come on, boy, get out of the boat. Now, notice none of the other disciples wanted to leave the boat. 
Only Peter did. Also, these boats, <laughs> if you read elsewhere in, in other versions of the, in other books of the Bible, this boat was filling with water. They were bailing as fast as they could, but the waves were filling it up faster than they could bail. When a boat finally gets to the point where there's more water in the boat than there's supposed to be, what happens? The boat sinks. And a lot of times on these boats, when the boat sinks because of the sails and everything else, there, it creates a suction. And with the sails and all that that is now on it, people can get actually drawn down into the water and sink with the boat. So the safest place to be in situations like this is away from the boat. Just get out. Swim away from the boat. If you try and hang on to the boat, you are going to die. That's the situation these boys are in. Jesus says, come on, Peter, get out of the boat. Come with me. The other disciples are staying in a boat that is about to sink. Peter, by faith, says, I'm going to go with Jesus. And he gets out of the boat. What do you think the other disciples are saying as Peter is getting out of the boat? Let me rephrase this conversation and do a common Christian situation today. There's 12 disciples there. One is going to take a step of faith. What do the other churches say? Other denominations, we'll put it like that. One is going to operate by faith and obey Jesus. Jesus said, come, they're going to come. These other churches, these other denominations, these other disciples in the boat are like, Peter, what are you doing? Get back in this boat. Don't go out there on that faith walk. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Only Jesus can walk on the water. Peter, we don't believe in walking on the water. We're, after all, we're just mortal men. Get back in this boat. We don't believe in that stuff. That's what you would hear from churches today. Peter ignored them. He ignored the storm. He ignored the wind. He ignored the waves. He ignored the other disciples who said, don't do that. And he focused on his Savior, on his Lord, on his Master. And what does the Bible say? Peter came down out of the ship and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. He is the only human being other than Jesus that ever walked on the water. Nobody else had done it up to that point in time. Not Elijah or anyone else. Peter walked on the water. I've walked on the water. It's, it's not as easy as what you might think. Brother Bob, you walked on the water? Oh, yeah. Many, many times. Have you ever walked on the water? Literally, I mean, have you ever walked on the water? People are probably like, this guy's crazy. Nobody can walk on the water. I've walked on the water. I preached this in a church. When I asked the congregation, I said, how many of you here have ever walked on the water? I was the only one that raised my hand. And they're looking at me like you're looking at me right now. I can hear you looking at me like that. And I said, I was born and raised up in Michigan. Those lakes freeze over. And then they all start laughing. So yeah, I walked on the water. It was frozen but I still walked on the water, glory to God. Now, let me ask you, now you're probably laughing right now, but let me ask you this. How many of you slipped and fell on the ice before? Again, I raised my hand on that. So even when God freezes the water so you can walk on it, you still can't walk on the water. 
Amen. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Glory to God. I got somebody's attention with that one. But listen to me. Peter focused on Jesus. His single focus was walking to Jesus. And he got close. He got real close to Jesus. He was within one arm's reach of Jesus. Because we're going to see that in a second. He was right there, maybe two or three feet away, tops. And then it says, and when he saw the wind strong, boisterous, he was afraid. He took his eyes off of Jesus and started looking around. At first, he's probably like, look at me. And then he's like, what am I doing out here? At first, he was focused completely on Jesus. And then as he got right to Jesus, he started looking like, this is awesome. I am not supposed to be out here. And fear entered back in. Faith left. Fear came in. When he first climbed out of that boat, Fear left, faith came. As long as he stayed focused on the word, Jesus is the word, John chapter 1, right? Jesus is the word. As long as he focused on the word, faith came. And he overcome everything that was happening in the natural. He overcame the danger. He overcame the, the wind. He overcame the waves. He walked on liquid water, not frozen water like we can. He walked on liquid water. As long as he stayed focused on what the Word said, which Jesus is the Word, and he said, come, come to me. And he walked on the water. When he took his eyes off the water, just to look around and say, I'm here, and look at all this. Man, look at all this, and I'm here. And fear came. Notice this next verse. And beginning to sink. Beginning to sink. I don't know about you. I have never seen any person begin to sink. If you walked off a deck into a swimming pool, if you walked off a pier into the water, you don't begin to sink. You go straight down. Bloop, you are underwater. You don't jump in and then slowly go down into the water. You sink immediately. But this doesn't say that. In verse 30, it says, beginning to sink. He was walking on the water. And he took his eyes off Jesus and said, look at me, I'm out here. Look at me, I'm out here. And he slowly started to go down. In other words, his faith just didn't leave him. His faith was getting weaker. Which slowly, he, you know, all of a sudden is at his ankles, then at his knees, and maybe halfway up his thighs. And then he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Now I know he was right there with Jesus because it says immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. He had to be 18 inches, you know, 24 inches, maybe three feet max away. Jesus reached out his hand, caught him, pulling himself back up and said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter did not have massive amounts of faith. He didn't have, you know, faith equal to God. Peter had a little faith and was able to walk on water. Look at that. Little faith. Jesus, he several times would berate his disciples. Where is your faith? 
O ye of little faith. And a couple times he said, you have great faith. But here, Peter, who didn't have great faith, he didn't even have moderate faith. He had little faith. But the point being, he, with just a little faith, was able to walk on water. Faith is the factor. Whether it's little, whether it's moderate, whether it's great, faith is still a factor. But just, you know, Jesus said, if you had faith as big as a little tiny grain of mustard seed, you could command this mountain, be thou removed and plant thyself into the sea, and it should obey you. You could speak to this tree and tell it to remove itself from its presence by its roots and go to the sea, and it would obey you. Little tiny seed of faith can move a massive mountain. Little tiny seed of faith will let you walk above your circumstances. That water boisterous and the winds and the waves and, and everything going on trying to kill these disciples. That little tiny bit of faith allowed Peter to rise above the circumstances. To rise above everything that was trying to kill him and walk on it. He was walking on the stuff that was trying to kill him. He had conquered it. But when he took his eyes off of the word, he slowly started to sink. His faith got weaker. What's the point of that story? Stay focused on Jesus. Even in the midst of the pandemic, stay focused on Jesus. Even if you come down with the virus, stay focused on Jesus. Well, what if I die? Stay focused on Jesus. What would be better? Tell me what would be better. If you get the virus, are you going to give up on Jesus or are you going to pray more to Jesus? Put it like that. If you come down with the virus, that is really the time you, not, you need to start to pray. But you can go through it knowing that if you do die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You take your last breath here and die, this body physically dies, you are immediately in the presence of Jesus. If you're a believer. If you are not a believer, the options don't look good. And that's what this pandemic is doing. It is showing people. I mean, there are, there's reports of people who have been isolated for a month or more right now, getting sick. How is that happening? One report I've seen, a lady had ordered a, a delivery of groceries, and they brought them and put them on her front step. No contact with anybody. She went out, got the groceries, brought them in the house, and the virus must have been on the package or something like that. And she got the virus and ended up dying came down with it, got sick, and ended up dying. And they're like, how could that happen? The only, you know, by that time, you know, because the, the virus will only stay on these packages, you know, a day, maybe two. So when they went to test it, they couldn't find it because it was no longer active. But the only thing she did was bring the package into the house. So they, they, they figured that's where it came from. Somebody at the grocery store had packed it, or the driver had been exposed to it, or whatever the case may be. That's how she got it. So you can isolate yourself as much as you want. That does not mean you won't get sick. Matter of fact, the flattening of the curve, as they call it, is not meant to stop the virus. It's not going to go away. They, 
these reports are coming out saying this virus has been here for years and years and years. The coronavirus is not something that just happened. It's been, you know, 10, 15, 20 years in society. This strain of the virus is what's new. But the virus itself, you have to be exposed to it. Your body has to build up its own immunities. You know, they're talking about this vaccination that's going to take 18 months or something to develop. What is the vaccination? They're going to give you the virus. You will get the virus when you get the vaccination shot. People think, I'll get a vaccination shot, then I'll be all right. You're going to get sick. The virus is designed to make you sick. So your body, your own body will build up its own immunity defenses against it. That, you know, if you take the numbers from any nation, the percentages work out just the same. You know, they're saying, well, the United States of America has more people contaminated and sick than any other nation in the world. Well, you know, China, we don't know because they don't tell the truth about anything anyway. But if you take a nation that has 34 million people, and look at how many people got sick and how many die. And then you take the United States with 334 million people and how many gotten sick and how many die. The percentages are the same. Whether you have a thousand people that get sick and one dies, or 10,000 get sick and 10 die, or a hundred thousand get sick and a hundred die, or a million people get sick and a thousand die, or 100 million get sick and 10,000, the numbers are the same. The percentages come out to be the exact same thing. The flattening of the curve is not meant like, okay, we beat it and the virus is gone. We can now get back to no. No. The flattening of the curve actually extends the amount of time the virus is going to infect society. The only purpose for this social distancing and isolation and shutting down the economy was so that the hospital systems itself did not get overrun. And, you know, if you had 300 million people and 100 million of them got sick and flooded the hospital that's only set up for, say, 25 million hospital beds, there's a problem. But if all of society got exposed to it at the same time. This whole thing would be over with in about three months' time. Okay? But because the hospital system would have been overrun, the death rate would have been much higher. So by flattening the curve, this thing probably won't be over with for a year instead of three months. Instead of you know, 100 million people getting sick in 30 days, 100 million people are going to get sick over the course of a year. That's what the flattening of the curve is doing. So don't be misled by thinking, you know, okay, once they open everything up, we're good to go. No. There will still be people being sick. There will still be people dying a year from now from this virus. So don't be misled by that misguided advice or, or ideas. The point I'm trying to make is this. You can overcome this virus. You can overcome the situation. You can overcome all of this by keeping your focus on Jesus. Amen? You know, uh, we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. We're supposed to live our life by faith and not by what we see or what we hear, but by the word of God. Why would anybody want to sit in front of the TV watching news 18 hours a day? You know, the news channels are, you know, reporting, you know, these are the number of people that died today. These are the number of people that are sick today. These are the numbers. These are the numbers. These are the numbers. These are the numbers. And everybody's like, oh, my God, what is happening? This is so bad. You've heard me say before. I'll say it one more time here. I get up in the morning. I watch about 20 minutes of news. And then I come in and I do my Bible study time and my prayer time and I begin my day. 
And then at dinner, I'll go back out while I'm eating dinner. I'll flip the, the evening news on because that's about what time I eat dinner. And, you know, I might watch five minutes of the local news just to see what's happening locally. And then I flip it over to the national because I catch up on the national news, my current events type thing. But 15, 20 minutes and I'm like, okay, I'm done with this. And I don't turn it on again the rest of the night till tomorrow morning, the next morning. Well, Brother Bob, shouldn't you stay informed? No, I don't need to stay informed about how many people are dying, how many people are sick. That does not concern me. What concerns me is God's word. That's what's concerning me. Because that's the answer. This word is the answer. You know, as we get ready to wrap all this up here in a few minutes, let's look over, turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. This is the story about blind Bartimaeus. Now you talk about someone who had a hard life. There was no social programs in ancient Judea. There was no social security disability. There was no welfare. There was no Medicaid. There was no food stamps. It didn't matter if you were blind or not. You still had to provide for yourself. Now, they gave them special garments to wear so that, you know, people realize, okay, well, uh, he's recognized by the government as being able to ask for offerings and stuff. So I can, it, I feel okay giving him this. That's his garment that he wore. And he knew, this is my spot where I sit. This is every day I get up. I know exactly how many steps it takes to the corner. And then I turn right. And then I know exactly how many steps I take to the next corner and I turn left. And then I know exactly how many steps it takes for me to get to my spot and I sit in my spot. How many of you know exactly to the minute how long it takes you to get to work? You know exactly at what corner you're going to turn. You know exactly where you're going to park your car. You know exactly where your desk is. And every day you get up and you go to that desk and you sit. Why? So that at the end of the week or every two weeks or whatever you get paid, your pay cycle is, you get your offering. And that's the routine you are in. This virus has upset your routine. It'd be like blind Bartimaeus walking down that street and they say, oh, we got construction here. You got to go a different way. What do you mean I got to go a different way? I have no idea what a different way is. That's how upset people are right now because their routine has been upset. But blind Bartimaeus, he's sitting there one day, cup out, shaking whatever change is in there, trying to dr draw people's attention to him. So they'll drop a couple more pennies in there. Suddenly, this commotion's going on. And he hears Jesus of Nazareth is walking by. Jesus is on a mission to go to Jerusalem. He has to be there before Passover. He has so many things he has to have in place and already accomplished before Passover comes because that's when he has to be prepared as the human sacrifice for all of mankind. Jesus is on a mission. He is focused on what it is he has to do. He hears people following him. He hears people calling out to him all the time. And he's just focused. He's walking. He has people around, his people around him, making sure that he gets to go where he wants to go. Blind Bartimaeus sitting there. Day after day, year after year, just sitting there, jiggling his cup. Mild-mannered, meek, quiet Artemis. And he hears Jesus of Nazareth is walking by. He knows this is the only person that can heal me. He's healed other blind people I've heard. And now he's walking by me. I need to get his attention. And he yells out, Jesus! Jesus! 
people are saying, Bartimaeus, shut up. Shut up. What are you doing? Why? Just be quiet. Jesus, have mercy on me. He's had mercy on others. He's have mercy on me. Jesus continues to walk. Go down to verse 46. When he heard Jesus, verse 47, he began to cry out, say, Jesus, son of David. That caught Jesus' attention. Son of David means he who's going to inherit David's throne. That caught Jesus' attention. Many people said, shut up, shut up. But he yelled the louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, that's the one who's inheriting the throne. That's going to be the king. Have mercy is a beg from a person, a commoner to the king. And Jesus stopped. It caught his attention. And commanded Bartimaeus to be brought to him. And they said, hey, congratulations, you got his attention. He wants to see you. And we read elsewhere where he threw off his garment and came up to Jesus. And Jesus said, what will you that I should do to you? What is it you want? You called me. What is it I can do for you? Now, he could have asked for anything. He could say, I need a new house. The one I got is too small. I need new clothes. I need to get some more money so I can take care of myself because I'm blind and unable to work. He could have asked for any of that. That would have treated the circumstances, but not the condition. He said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Because you heal my blind eyes where I can see, I can get a job. And when I got a job, I'll have more money. And when I have more money, I can get better clothes and I can get a better place to live and I can take care of myself. All I need you to do, Jesus, is heal my sight. And Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. He received his sight and realized, forget about a job, I'm following Jesus. And that made him whole. His provision was made. His clothes got better. He had money in his pocket. He, he got a house, but he maintained and always was a follower of Jesus from that time forward. That's what's happening in this virus. People who were blind spiritually, that had been so settled into the routine of get up, have coffee, leave for work at 717, arrive to work at 755, walk into my desk, clock in at 8 o'clock, and there I sit until it's time for me to go home. That's their routine. And that routine had been upset and is, is currently upset. They can't go to work. Their routine's upset. They're not making money. Their routine is upset. They're unable to buy food and pay bills and go on vacations and, and go to ball games and things like that. Their routine is upset. But God... But God, through the power of this internet, more people are now hearing the gospel of salvation than at any time in human history. The devil meant this virus for harm. God has turned it to good. People are coming to Jesus blind. They have no clue what is happening right now. They don't know what to do. And they call out, Jesus! says, what can I do for you? Lord, 
I'm yours. Please take care of me. Heal me. Protect me. Provide for me. But I'm yours. I call out to the only one who can do anything in this situation. I can guarantee you, you can call up the White House switchboard and ask to speak to the President of the United States, and you are not going to get through. I've talked with President Trump. God had me in a unique position where I got to actually talk to him and put my arm on his shoulder. My grandson was like, you touched the president, right? Once in a lifetime. Now, I've talked to several presidents over the, my life, but I'm talking, you know, being in a unique spot at a unique point in time that God orchestrated. But I have actually had, I have it recorded because I, I gave him, a, he gave me a one question interview. The point I'm trying to make is I can't call it. You know, I've talked to him. I can't call him up and get him on the phone. Neither can you. But there's someone higher than President Trump. And that is God. And you can talk to him on one second's notice. You can dial him up in prayer. And he will answer. Whatever it is you need, if you need healing from this virus, you need protection from this virus, you need a source of additional income right now because of the virus, you need whatever it is you need, you can ask God and receive it. If you believe, you receive. John 5 verses 1 through 9 talks about Jesus as the great physician. You need healing? He's the one that provided it. By his stripes, you're already healed. The body may not know it. Your spirit knows it. And that's the one that needs to be healed most of all. This body will decay and die. Amen. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior, as we close, this is the day, praise God. And you'll have God's direct line. Just pray after me right now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my salvation. You provided the way through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and death on the cross. And when he raised up from the dead, defeating death, hell, the grave, sickness, disease, everything, that made it possible for me to receive it too. Jesus, thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for the gift of everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for blessing me making me a child of the Most High God, heir of God, and joint heir with you of all things. Lord, I praise you for that. And I ask you to come into my heart right now and create in me this new man, one that loves God, one that's called by God as a child of God. And I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, email me at brotherbob at ftfm.org. Till next time, it's Pastor Bob reminding you, be blessed in all that you do.